Um, okay, so we will be moving on to our next presentation, our last presentation. Um, will be an integrated approach to managing burrowing rodents by Roger Baldwin. He's a cooperative extension specialist in the Department of Wildlife, Fish and Conservation Biology at UC Davis. Welcome, Roger. Hey, you bet. Let me see if I can get everything up here. Could somebody confirm that you can see my screen? I can see your screen. You're gonna push presenter view. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. There we go. Thank All you. right, great. So um, apparently we're saving the best for last, right, everybody? All right. Um, so today I am gonna be talking about an integrated approach to managing burrowing rodents. And so I thought we'd start off today by providing some background information on the different species uh, that I'm gonna be covering here today. One of these is the California ground squirrel. Uh, I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar with ground squirrels, but just as a refresher, they are a grayish brown um, colored squirrel. Uh, they oftentimes have a mottled or speckled type appearance associated with their fur, and they have a semi-bushy tail. They also are social, so that means they live together in groups, which means you can usually see them out there on the landscape fairly easily. Um, and the damage that they cause uh, can be quite extensive and quite varied. It does include girdling of vines and trees, so they'll climb up into the vines of the trees and, and feed on the bark uh, in certain situations. And they certainly chew on irrigation lines, which is one of the more common forms of damage that we see with ground squirrels. Um, and their abundant burrow openings cause all kinds of issues as well. Um, you know, if we're talking about uh, a vineyard type setting, certainly they can be hazards to uh, farm workers, uh, farm equipment. Uh, we see increased soil erosion from water channeling down burrow systems, uh, a variety of different issues that we can see um, with ground squirrel burrow systems. But ground squirrel species are diurnal. Um, that means they're active during the daytime. So again, this makes it pretty easy for us to see them out there on the landscape, as opposed to some of the other species, which tend to be more nocturnal and a little bit more difficult to see out there and, and potentially identify uh, as to the, the culprit causing damage. Now, as the name would imply, uh, ground squirrels do live in burrow systems. Sometimes those burrow systems are up and underneath structures, and obviously that causes problems. Uh, some other places that we can key in on when looking for ground squirrel activity or is um, for burrow systems along field edges, fence rows, roadsides, um, oftentimes right next to the base of trees, etc. cetera. Uh, so these are some of the areas that you can key in on when initially looking for ground squirrel activity moving into a certain area. That said, once they become established in a particular area, they can start creating burrow systems and, and burrow entrances just about anywhere. We we'll also spend a lot of time talking about pocket gophers. Uh, pocket gophers are burrowing rodents about six to eight inches in length. Of course, they are rarely seen above ground. So for us to know when gophers are present in an area, we generally have to look for, for some other form of sign and, and for gophers, that's usually their mounds. This photo at the bottom right gives you an idea of what a typical gopher mound will look like, usually horseshoe shaped in appearance with a plug towards the lower end of one side of that mound. This is in contrast to mole mounds, which tend to be more conical or volcano shaped in appearance. Um, it is important that you can tell the difference between the two, uh, in part because gophers cause more damage. They're rodent species, and so they feed directly on plants, which, which results in indirect damage to that plant, versus moles, which are insectivores, and they only eat you know, worms and grubs and, and things like that. So they're not going to uh, damage plants directly. Uh, that said, their mounds will cause all the same kind of issues that we see with gopher mounds. So it's, it's not like they don't cause any problems. It's just that the problems tend to be a little bit less. Also, the uh, management tools that we use for, for gophers are quite a bit different from, uh, than for moles. And so again, it is important that you can tell the difference between the two. Now, as far as damage is concerned from gophers, probably the most common form of damage is direct feeding of the taproot of the plant, which will weaken and or kill that particular plant. Now, if we're talking about trees or vines, they can also girdle those below ground. And the top photo is an example of a tree that's been girdled 
uh, below ground. And as you can imagine, this is a very difficult form of damage to try to deal with because you don't generally know that's occurring until you start to see a loss in vigor of that tree or vine. And at that point in time, it's probably too late. Uh, plus, uh, if it's happening to one or two trees or vines out there, it's probably happening to multiples. And so we can see fairly substantial losses pretty rapidly from this kind of uh, gopher damage. But of course, their burrow systems cause all kinds of issues as well. Uh, they can kill uh, some plants directly just by burying them. Uh, they certainly create weed seed beds. Um, basically, when they're bringing that soil up to the surface, it contains a lot of seeds. And so we can see a proliferation of uh, weeds associated with gopher mounds. Uh, their burrow systems uh, increase soil erosion. Here's an example of a vineyard over in Sonoma County where we had uh, water channeling down through that burrow system, uh, resulting in um, su a substantial erosion issues. And of course, their burrow systems are hazards to, to farm workers and, and farm equipment as well. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about today are meadow voles. Voles are sometimes referred to as meadow mice. So it's possible you may be more familiar with that term. Uh, they are a small rodent species, about four to six inches in length. Um, even though they're a, a, a somewhat smaller rodent species, they are still a little bit larger than a house mouse or a deer mouse. Uh, so you can keep that in mind in, in helping to try to differentiate between the two. Um, the really challenging aspect about voles is that their populations do tend to cycle quite a bit. And so you can uh, have very low vole densities for several years, but then all of a sudden in a matter of just a few months, their populations can really explode. And it can result in situations where you can literally feel like you are being overrun by voles. Uh, in fact, there are some studies that have shown uh, several thousand voles per acre in alfalfa. So you can imagine uh, the kinds of damage that they can cause when they get to those, those kinds of densities. The voles do live in burrow systems as well. Their burrow systems tend to be open. Uh, so they have open burrow systems. Gophers have closed burrow systems. As far as the burrow systems are concerned, they're usually about an inch to inch and a half in diameter. And they also oftentimes have, have these runways that go back and forth to connect those burrow entrances. These runways are really good diagnostic to let you know that, that uh, voles are present in a particular area. And for, as far as damage is concerned, you know, if we're talking about trees or vines, it's primarily girdling damage. Um, they usually girdle trees or vines from ground level up to maybe six to eight inches above ground. Contrast that with gophers, which usually girdle from ground level below. Uh, so that can be a good diagnostic. It's not exact. Sometimes voles will girdle a little bit below ground as well, um, but it is still a, a good rule of thumb there. Other kinds of damage would include um, chewing on irrigation lines. Again, you know, we're talking about rodent species and they like to chew on all kinds of things. And so we can definitely see damage from, from chewing on those irrigation lines as well. When it comes to managing these species, we certainly do recommend that folks utilize an integrated approach as you will generally find better results if you use multiple strategies than if you relied on any single one approach. Of course, there's a variety of different tools that could be incorporated into an integrated program. Um, for pocket gophers, for example, maybe you wanted to utilize bait application to initially knock down a gopher population and then follow that up with a trapping program to target some of those remaining individuals in that population. The important point here being you really should um, try to focus on using multiple strategies as you're going to find better results if you use multiple strategies than um, relying on any single one approach. And part of the reason why is because uh, in, not all individuals in a population are going to be equally susceptible to uh, certain tools. You know, for baiting, not all individuals in a population may want to consume that bait. And so if you only apply bait, you're going to consistently be missing those individuals. And that proportion of the population is going to increase over time. Plus, with some of these tools, they can learn to avoid them. They can develop resistance to certain rodenticides, et cetera. So it's really important that you mix and match those tools. It's also important to understand a little bit about the biology of the species that you're trying to manage, as well as the ecology of the system that you're working in, as this can greatly influence the efficacy of management programs as well. And this chart hopefully does a good job of, of illustrating this. This chart was designed specifically for the California ground squirrel, and what we see on this chart 
our major activity periods for ground squirrels, major food resources, and then the best time for control for three of the more commonly used strategies for, for managing ground squirrels. And this is broken down across the different seasons of the year. So what do we see when we look at this chart? Well, there's a variety of information, obviously, but one of the first things that I noticed is that ground squirrels utilize two primary food resources, but those food resources um, vary depending upon the time of year. So early in the year, they're eating primarily green foliage. This is important because we have to keep in mind that when we use rodenticide baits, those rodenticide baits are generally seed or pelletized type products. So if we want to get good uptake by ground squirrels, we should wait until later in the year when they're actively feeding on seeds. That's when we get good um, bait acceptance and when baiting works well for ground squirrels. Conversely though, um, we see that fumigation works really well uh, in late winter through early spring, not so well later in the year. The reason why is because for these fumigants to work, we generally need um, high soil moisture. Uh, when we have high soil moisture, that closes off the pores in the soil, closes off cracks, things like that, which holds those toxic gases in at a much greater rate. As the soil dries out, those cracks grow, the pores in the soil grow, and the gases dissipate at too great a rate for the fumigants to work. So early in the year is a great time for fumigants, later in the year for baiting. And so these are just a couple of examples of, of how knowing a little bit about the um, biology of the species that you're trying to manage, as well as the ecology of the system that you're working in, can greatly influence the efficacy of a management program. So with that, we're gonna now jump into a more detailed discussion on a lot of the different tools uh, that are out there for managing these burrowing species. And this chart gives you an idea of some, but certainly not all of the different tools that could be used for managing ground squirrels, poppy gophers, and voles. Uh, you can see that some of these tools are potentially effective for all the species we're talking about here today. Um, and, and for others, not so much. Uh, burrow fumigants, for example, are generally not used for, for voles because their burrow systems tend to be too shallow to hold toxic gases within uh, them at a, great, at a high enough rate for it to work, but also because those burrow systems tend to be far too numerous for you to be able to treat all of the burrow systems um, effectively and practically. Likewise, we don't generally use trapping for voles, again, because their numbers tend to be too numerous for trapping to be practical. Uh, we do use exclusion for voles, but generally not for these other species. Um, repellents have traditionally not been effective for burrowing rodents, but there are some newer products uh, that have been tested and or are now available um, that I'm going to discuss here today that, that may provide um, some potential options along those route, along that route. Uh, frightening devices are, are really not effective for these species, so I don't really recommend their use there. And then lastly, I will just mention that shooting can be a tool that can be used to um, manage ground squirrels, but shooting tends to be pretty labor intensive. So there's usually more cost effective and, and reliable uh, tools for managing ground squirrels, but certainly in some cases shooting is a good practical tool. And so, so you may be able to incorporate that in, in some settings uh, uh, into your ground squirrel management programs. Another tool, that oftentimes is discussed, uh, but was not um, showcased in the, in the previous chart is biocontrol. And with biocontrol, we're talking about the use of natural predators to help control pest populations. When it comes to biocontrol, the barn owl is probably the poster child um, for this, this uh, management tool. Now, of course, with um, barn owls, the general process is to put up barn owl boxes around the perimeter of a vineyard or an orchard or any kind of field for that matter. And, and the basic premise then being that the barn owl will utilize that, um, have their young and, and hopefully predate heavily in that particular area. Certainly we know that barn owls are very efficient rodent, rodent predators. Um, a breeding pair will feed on anywhere from one to 3,000 rodents in a given year, depending upon the size of the rodents that they're, they're feeding on. So they are very efficient predators. And there is some pretty recent um, research that's come out that has shown that they uh, can negatively impact gopher populations in, in certain settings. In other words, they can reduce gopher populations um, in some areas. However, um, there's other information out there that suggests that in some settings, they don't 
um, substantially reduce those those uh, rodent numbers. And so I think there's a lot to be learned yet when it comes to uh, how effective barn owls can actually be for managing rodent populations. Certainly at a minimum, they do not hurt. Um, and they, they have the potential to provide at least some uh, benefit when it comes to rodent management as well. So I do think, you know, putting up barn owl boxes is a win-win for everybody and, and certainly something that, that you um, could consider. I do think it's important to mention though that, that you know, barn owls are nocturnal species, ground squirrels are diurnal species, so they don't exist in the same um, uh, time scales there. So I would not, you know, be relying upon barn owls to, to try to manage ground squirrel populations. They potentially could for gophers or voles and, and mice uh, for that matter as well. Sometimes people do talk about utilizing raptor perches um, as an alternative to barn owl boxes, but particularly for encouraging the use of, of hawks and, and eagles and, and potentially falcons in certain areas to control ground squirrel populations. Um, unfortunately, I have not seen any data to suggest that this is an, an overly effective tool. Again, it doesn't hurt to have them out there and we love to have these predators out there to, to um, help provide any kind of benefits they can uh, when it comes to rodent control. But I've just not seen a lot to, to suggest that that's gonna be an overly effective tool for, for ground squirrel populations. Another tool that we have for managing these species is habitat modification. And with habitat modification, we're talking about altering the desirability of an area for a particular species. Uh, there's a variety of different examples that we could look at for habitat modification. One is, is simply burrow destruction. Um, so for example, let's say you have a ground squirrel population, and then let's say that you're wildly successful and you get rid of every ground squirrel on your property. That's great. That's a, an, an awesome initial first step. But it is, it's important to remember that even though you get rid of the ground squirrel, the burrow systems are still going to be in place. And likely your neighbors are not as efficient at managing ground squirrels as you are. So that means that adjacent populations of ground squirrels will very quickly be able to reinvade onto your property by utilizing those old burrow systems to establish new colonies. So if you could just simply destroy those old burrow systems, then that could potentially slow down reinvasion. And that's a, a thought process that a predecessor of mine um, looked at a number of years ago. And they found that if you deep ripped old burrow systems down to a foot and a half in depth, that did substantially reduce potential reinvasion by ground squirrels into those areas. But you do have to go a foot and a half deep. One foot was not deep enough. Um, so there is, you know, um, some challenges associated with, with ripping to, to that depth. It's not going to be a practical tool in, in many of your perennial cropping systems. However, if you're thinking about taking a vineyard, for example, out of production um, and then going to replant, one good strategy would be to get rid of the ground squirrels um, and then um, deep rip and, and destroy those old burrow systems before you replant. Uh, so, so you do have that window of opportunity there to, to take advantage of that. For gophers, there's really not a lot of information out there as far as um, how deep you would need to go to destroy burrow systems, but based on the average depth of gopher burrow systems, I would guess you would need to be at least a foot and maybe a foot and a half uh, in depth as well to, to realize those kinds of benefits. Now, another tool that we can sometimes utilize is flood irrigation. And here with this video in the bottom, um, you can see some of the potential benefits. You see all of these birds and the, and the coyote picking up the uh, voles and, and occasionally a gopher out there as well. And basically, you know, when you have a situation in which you can still flood irrigate, and that brings those rodents up to the surface and a lot of these predators can go out there and, and pick off those rodents. And so, you know, certainly I understand that flood irrigation is not possible in, in many settings anymore, but if you are somebody who does retain the ability to utilize flood irrigation, it really can be a great tool when it comes to managing uh, these, these kinds of rodent pests. And I suspect that some of the proliferation we've seen throughout a, a lot of the Central Valley, for example, um, has been due to the loss of, of flood irrigation. And another great example of the importance of habitat modification is uh, with voles. 
Voles are a very cover dependent species. And so a lot of times what you see is, uh, in this case, a, a vineyard with a lot of vegetative growth. Well, that vegetation provides ideal cover and food resources for voles. Uh, if you can keep that area mowed low, then that's a great way to deter vole presence in a particular area uh, because they are so cover dependent. Um, if they don't have sufficient cover, then they're susceptible to predation and they move on to other areas. And so again, if you have vegetation um, in these row middles, keep it as low as possible. Um, and certainly try to keep a vegetation free area uh, from around the base of any trees or vines. Uh, to again deter any kind of vole activity in those particular areas. So I, I will just stress this again, for voles, habitat modification really is one of the best tools that you have for managing those species. So do take advantage of it if voles are a problem for you. So one other tool that we can use for voles is exclusion. Um, and when it comes to vine or, or tree crops, usually what we're talking about is the use of trunk protectors. Uh, so these are usually hard plastic structures that are used around uh, the base of, of a tree or a vine. And that it is meant to keep voles from, from girdling on those, those trunks. They can work very well if utilized properly. If you're gonna use these kind of trunk protectors, you should bury them five or six inches below ground. If you simply lay them on the top of the, the surface of the soil, you actually might see increased damage from voles because you create the perfect environment for them when you do that. Basically the vole can just crawl up and underneath that structure. Now they have access to food as well as cover from um, predatory species. So if you're gonna utilize these kinds of, of trunk protectors, uh, you certainly do want to utilize them in the proper manner. But as you can imagine, in looking at all of these out there, it is costly and, and time consuming uh, to utilize trunk protectors if your sole purpose is for, for vole exclusion. So what if we had another strategy uh, to, to utilize instead? That's where repellents potentially come in. You know, repellents are usually relying on things like objectionable odors or unpleasant tastes to deter animals from a particular area. Um, unfortunately, though, they usually haven't worked well for rodents. Um, you know, some of the repellents, for example, rely on predator urines or, or fear-inducing responses to try to scare the voles out of a particular area. Um, but everything wants to eat voles out there. And their lifespans are so short, they can't really sit there and, and worry too much about, about being eaten. They have to go about their, their um, existence. And so putting this kind of um, fear-inducing um, product out there usually isn't enough to scare them away, not, not for any extended period of time. So most of the repellents usually haven't worked too well for, for these kind of rodent species. But there's another kind of repellent out there as well, and those are post-ingestive products. Post-ingestive um, repellents basically rely on the animal consuming it, eating a small amount of it one time, and then that causes them to get sick. And when they get sick, then they learn to avoid feeding on that material again. Anthoquinone is an example of a post-ingestive repellent. Um, it is currently, it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, registered as a bird repellent in some states, although not in California. Now, we initially started some work uh, with some colleagues, colleagues at the National Wildlife Research Center uh, a few years back, looking at the potential of anthoquinone as a mammal repellent. And one of the species that we had the best results uh, with was the uh, meadow vole. And we found that anthoquinone was in fact highly repellent uh, for feeding activity for voles in a lab setting. And so we wanted to, to set up a field trial to, to see if it, it might work in, in certain settings as well. And so what we established was a trial looking at girdling damage in young tree crops. Um, we thought this would be an excellent um, potential avenue to, to test this product because we know that voles do like to girdle um, young stems, but they also don't climb very well. And so all we would need to do is treat the bottom 10 or 12 inches of a uh, vine or a tree, and then hopefully that would be enough to deter girdling damage. So we did conduct this study 
in a couple of different seasons, basically hot, dry, and, and cool, wet. And we found um, very uh, promising results. We had anywhere from a 10 to 20 fold reduction in girdling damage uh, for voles for those that were treated with antiquinone. Um, so this was very exciting, very encouraging. But of course, for a repellent to work, it's gonna have to work for an extended period of time. You can't be out there applying it every couple of weeks and, and expect that to be practical. So we also looked at the longevity of this product, extending out to five and six weeks, depending upon the season we looked at. I'm not gonna get into any specific details, but suffice it to say that up to um, six weeks after application, we had absolutely no uptick in girdling damage. And based on some other anecdotal information, uh, we would expect um, antiquinone um, to be effective as a repellent uh, for potentially a full year, maybe even more than that. Um, so we are pretty excited about these results. Um, the downside is, is that this product still is not registered for use in California, but it is currently going through the registration process. So the hope is, is that here in the near future, this will be a tool that you could potentially utilize to help mitigate bull girdling damage to, to vines and young trees. So many of you have problems with pocket gophers as well. Um, I don't know how much subsurface drip irrigation is, is currently being used in, in your area, but certainly <clears throat> in certain parts of the state, we're starting to see a, a lot more um, SDI being used in, in part because it is a very water efficient way of, of getting water to, to the crops. One of the biggest problems with SDI though is, is gophers. Um, the SDI is generally buried at the, the depth that gophers like to travel around in. And, when they do that, they come across this tape and then they start to chew on it and you get all kinds of issues out in fields from gophers chewing on SDI. And so there's um, been some work done for a number of years trying to develop a repellent um, to, to move gophers out of, of those particular areas to reduce that kind of chewing damage. And as of the first part of this year, um, there is now a repellent um, that can be used in subsurface drip irrigation systems, and that is Protect T. Uh, that's the, the commercial product. Um, the active ingredient is methylmercaptan, and it's basically it's just injected through the subsurface drip irrigation uh, with the irrigation water. Um, I've done some very early preliminary work on this in alfalfa, and we saw about a 41% reduction in gopher activity after treatment. So that's promising, but this was just for two fields. Uh, we need to do a lot more work on this yet uh, to really feel uh, comfortable with, with this product moving forward, but at least the early results are promising. We also need to, to um, take a look at whether or not it reduces um, the, this kind of chewing damage on the drip tape because that's really the, the most important aspect of this all. So stay tuned on that front, but, but there certainly is a new tool out there and some of the early results have been promising. Now we also have trapping as a tool to manage uh, burrowing rodent species. I'm gonna start off by talking about trapping for ground squirrels. Um, there's a variety of different kinds of traps out there on the market for ground squirrels, but they mostly just fall into two categories. Those are kill traps and live traps. Um, kill traps, as the name would imply, kills the animal after capture. Examples include body griffing traps, such as this Conibear 110, uh, which is oftentimes used around the burrow entrance of ground squirrels so that hopefully when they um, travel in or out, they get caught. There are also tube or tunnel style traps, which can be used, as well as box type squeeze traps. Um, those kinds of traps are usually baited to draw the ground squirrel into it. Now, the downside of the kill trap is, is that um, they're indiscriminate, and if a non-target animal enters into that trap, it can kill them just as quickly as it would a ground squirrel. So you have to be careful where you use kill traps. If you're concerned about non-target captures, in particular um, pets, uh, but other non-target wildlife species as well, then you might want to consider utilizing a live trap. And this trap here at the bottom right is a have a heart uh, or tomahawk style cage trap. Um, basically the animal walks in, steps on the treadle, uh, releases the trap door which shuts behind him and, and houses the animal inside the trap. Um, there's also a multi-catch trap such as the squirrelinator or the black fox repeating trap. Um, these are, are traps that have one-way doors. So think about a one-way swinging um, pet door. Um, 
it allows the animal in, but it doesn't allow them back out. And these can allow you to capture um, many ground squirrels at once. In some cases, I've seen photos of 15 or 20 ground squirrels in a single trap, so it is at least possible. Um, as you can probably guess, the benefit of this particular kind of trap is that if you capture a non-target species, you can simply release it from the trap unharmed. The downside of this kind of trap is that if you capture the target animal, then you are responsible for euthanizing the animal after capture. And this is a step that people sometimes aren't familiar with. Sometimes they think they can simply take the um, captured ground squirrel somewhere else and release it. Uh, the reality is though, that's illegal. It's against California Fish and Game Code to translocate wildlife like that. Um, and it's illegal for a number of good reasons, not the least of which is the fact that these um, wildlife species oftentimes uh, carry a variety of different diseases and parasites. And if you release an animal somewhere else, you potentially may be spreading those diseases or parasites into a new population. So it is important you keep that in mind. Translocation is not an option when it comes to trapping for ground squirrels. So you do have to euthanize the animal after capture. But of course, you should be doing so in a humane manner. And there are two techniques currently considered humane by the American Vet Association that would be practical in this situation. But the simplest is shooting. And so if you're in an area where you can legally discharge a firearm, then shooting may be the tool that you want to use. But in a lot of areas, it's not legal to discharge a firearm. Or in some situations, maybe you have a lot of ground squirrels um, that you have to euthanize. And in those cases, the use of a carbon dioxide euthanasia chamber would be the preferred tool. Um, these are basically devices that just allow you to insert the trap with the ground squirrel in it into the device, and then you pump carbon dioxide at a specified flow rate, which will cause the ground squirrel to pass out and eventually succumb to that gas. Um, if you're looking for more details on this, um, we do have a UC website. It's a ground squirrel best management practices website that has more details on this process. And I will provide you with the URL for that um, at the end of the presentation here today. So, uh, well, and one other thing I wanted to mention about euthanasia here. Um, drowning of animals used to be considered a humane form of euthanasia, but it no longer is. But more importantly than that, here in the state of California, euthanizing animals via drowning is now illegal. Um, so you do not want to be um, drowning these animals as a form of, of euthanasia. And I think it's always important that I bring that up because some of these traps, particularly these multi-catch traps, are oftentimes sold with a container to drown the animals after capture. And that is not legal in California. So just keep all of that in mind uh, if you're going to utilize trapping as a tool for ground score management. Now we also utilize trapping to manage pocket gophers as well. There's a variety of different traps out there on the market, um, but again, they, they mostly fall into two, two categories as well. Those are squeeze type traps and pincher style traps. Examples of squeeze type traps are this Victor Black Box. There's also the Gopher Hawk, which a lot of you are probably utilizing now. It's a, it's a pretty popular trap out there. Um, like I said, those are squeeze type traps. And for pincher style traps, we have the Maccabee, which is probably I'm guessing the most commonly used trap in the state, or at least it was up until uh, a few years ago. I've been around for well over a hundred years. Um, uh, so kind of a, a tried and true trap. Uh, there's the gofinator trap been around for, I'm gonna guess about 15 years now. The cinch trap, which has been around for about a hundred years. Uh, there's the Victor easy set, Johnson's quick set. And like I said, there's a variety of, of these styles of traps out there. Of course, the big question is always how effective are they? Are, you know, is one trap more effective than another? I certainly haven't tested all the different kinds of traps out there, but I have done some pretty extensive trap uh, testing um, comparing the um, uh, Maccabee to the Gofinator trap. And what we ended up finding out is that the Gofinator trap was a more effective trap. And it was more effective because it allowed us to capture larger gophers at a greater rate. And that's what this chart here at the bottom left is, is illustrating. Uh, along the x-axis, we have different size classes of gophers and, and along the y-axis, we have capture rates. And this is broken down by the um, gopher nanner trap represented by the solid line and the Maccabee by the dash line. And you can see is that as you get into the larger and larger size classes of gophers, we started to capture proportionally more and more when using the gopher nanner. In fact, we saw about a 23 to 25% increase in capture efficiency for each size class up. 
uh, that we had for gophers. Um, so really the gophinator trap seemed to be uh, a very effective trap and it's the trap that I have used for, for most of my subsequent um, studies for all of my um, subsequent gopher trapping studies. We also looked at the importance of covering trap sets or whether or not we could leave those trap sets uncovered. Um, the basic premise being if you um, cover a trap set, you're creating the illusion that nothing is wrong in the tunnel system. And so hopefully the gopher will go about its, its daily business and get caught at a high rate. Um, but conversely, if you left the trap set open, then maybe that would encourage investigation because gophers do not like openings in their tunnel systems. And if you're increasing investigation, then perhaps you can increase capture rates that way. What we found is that it actually didn't matter a whole lot either way. We did see a slight increase in capture efficiency during the hottest times of the year when he had covered trap sets, but that slight increase in efficiency was actually offset by the amount of time it took to cover and uncover those trap sets to the point where we were catching the same number of gophers per day, regardless of whether or not we were covering or uncovering them. And when we moved into the cooler times of the year, which would be you know now all the way through the, the middle to uh, end of spring, um, we actually had slightly higher capture rates when utilizing uncovered trap sets. So for me personally, I generally use uncovered trap sets because it saves me time and effort. But if you're somebody who likes to utilize covered trap sets or you are worried about non-target access to traps, then you know maybe you would want to utilize those covered trap sets. Certainly you can have success with them. We've also looked at attractants. Um, are there certain kinds of attractants we could use to increase capture efficiency? Um, we didn't see any real benefits from using attractants, so I don't really think that that's something you need to worry about. And we also looked at whether or not you need to exclude human scent, um, or if you could touch the traps with bare hands, if you can stick your fingers in the tunnels to, to figure out where they're branching, etc. cetera. Um, we found that human scent had no impact at all. This is what's very definitive in our study, at least. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't really be all that concerned about um, uh, human scent when it comes to, to um, trap and gophers. <clears throat> so we talked about some strategies to increase the um, efficacy of a trapping program, but we still haven't talked about how efficacious it actually is. Turns out it's highly efficacious. We've looked at it in wine grapes. We've looked at it in alfalfa. In both cases, we had 92 to 94 percent removal rates after two trapping sessions with with um, uh, with uh, uh, the gophinator trap. So uh, again, trapping is highly efficacious uh, when it comes to to managing gophers. Now we also utilize baiting or rodenticide baits uh, to manage uh, gophers, ground squirrels, and, and voles. Uh, when it comes to their use in ag settings, these are almost always restricted to use products, so you will have to be a certified applicator to utilize them. As far as the different kinds of products out there, there's first generation anticoagulants, which include difastinone, chlorofastinone, and sometimes warfarin for managing all three species, as well as the acute toxicant zinc phosphide, which kills after a single feed. Um, this can be used for all three species. Uh, strychnine is an acute toxicant as well, but it can only be used for ground or for uh, pocket gophers. So keep that in mind, only for pocket gophers, not for any other rodent species. Now for the first generation anticoagulants, for ground squirrel and vole control, um, they can be applied in one of three methods. Those include spot treatments, broadcast applications, and bait stations. Spot treatments are used when you have just a few burrow systems to, to treat. Um, basically, you're taking a designated amount of bait and spreading it very thinly around the burrow entrance. Uh, one of the CDFA products that's, that's available for use um, indicates the use of one third cup of bait spread around a 40 to 50 square foot area around the entrance of that burrow system. So think about that for a little bit. 40 to 50 square feet is a pretty large area. That means you're only gonna get a few pieces of grain per square foot. Does that look like the situation we see here in the bottom left? I would say the answer is definitively no in this case. What, we, what has happened here is an individual has piled bait up around those burrow entrances. And that is very much an illegal and dangerous application strategy because lots of animals can come along and feed on enough of this grain to get a lethal dose. Whereas if it's spread out properly, um, very few animals are adapted to be able to pick up enough of that grain to get a lethal dose, which is why we can um, safely use it in, in most such, uh, settings uh, for ground squirrel and vole control. Now we also can utilize broadcast applications. So this is used when we have uh, more numerous um, burrow systems to treat. Uh, it utilizes a calibrated seed spreader. 
on the deposit speed at set intervals over, over those areas. Of course, if we're talking about vineyard and orchard crop settings. Um, in, in those cases, we're, we're generally using bait stations and bait stations house bait within it, which excludes access to that bait by animals um, larger than the entrance to that bait station. Uh, so this is a, a good strategy um, for baiting in, in orchard and vineyard settings. One thing to keep in mind with these first generation anticoagulant products though, is that they are chronic feed materials. That means the animal generally needs to feed on it over the course of several days to get a lethal dose. So if we're utilizing broadcast applications or spot treatments, that means you need to treat at least twice, usually separated by four days to ensure that the animal has access to the bait over the course of that entire period where they need to have access to it for it to work well. Likewise, for bait stations, you need to make sure that, that you maintain a constant bait supply within that bait station. Otherwise, the ground squirrel may come and feed on it on days one or maybe one and two. If they eat all of that grain, then they won't have it again for days three, four, and five when they need it to get that lethal dose. And so you need to check those bait stations on a consistent basis to ensure that they're maintaining that bait supply. We can also use zinc phosphide for, for ground squirrel and vole control as well. Zinc phosphide, as I mentioned, is an acute toxin, so it kills after a single feed. But it also has a very distinctive odor and taste to it. Some kind of describe it as a garlicky type odor. And what happens is, is that odor and, and distinctive taste oftentimes leads to a ground squirrel or a vole just feeding on maybe two or three pieces of this grain. That's not enough to, to um, kill the animal, but it's enough to cause it to get sick. And then it learns that it got sick from eating that particular product and it won't feed on it again. That's called bait shyness. And so we don't want that bait shyness developing in these populations. So because of that, you number one, need to pre-bait with a clean grain, in other words, a non-toxic grain, before you do a zinc phosphide application to make sure that the target animals are actively feeding on it. Because if they aren't, then applying the zinc phosphide coated product isn't going to work because they're not going to feed on it over um, clean grain. And secondly, you want to make sure that non-target species are not feeding on this because it is an acutely toxic material. So that pre-baiting is really important um, to increase the safety of, of application, as well as to increase the acceptability of this particular product. Uh, so it is important to keep that in mind. I also mentioned, you know, it has that distinctive odor associated with it. When you put it in bait stations, that tends to magnify that odor. So we don't utilize zinc phosphide in bait stations. We only use it in broadcast or spot treatment applications. And because it is an acutely toxic material, we do not use it in or around buildings because we, we don't want negative impacts on, on um, domestic animals or, or people. Of course, we use baiting for managing pocket gophers as well. Um, we can use first generation anticoagulants and zinc phosphide as well as strychnine, but I can tell you that um, uh, almost all of the research suggests that strychnine is by far the most efficacious. So certainly when possible, strychnine is probably going to be your better option. For application strategies, the funnel and spoon method is fine if you have a few burrow systems to treat, but it's too labor intensive in most settings. Most people utilize one of these all-in-one probe and bait dispensers to apply bait to knock down um, gopher populations. Works pretty well. Um, if you have very extensive um, acreage to treat, you can certainly look into utilizing one of these burrow builders, which um, uh, creates an artificial tunnel system below ground. And then when the gopher travels over around, that comes across that tunnel system and consumes the, the bait that was applied uh, into it. The problem is with these devices, they, they're, they're a little bit hit or miss. Conditions have to be just right for them to work well. Soil conditions need to be just right. The depth needs to be just right. You need to make sure that the, the torpedo that's depositing the bait doesn't get plugged up, et cetera. So um, like I said, a little bit more hit or miss, not as consistently good as some of the other tools out there, but certainly it is the quickest and, and easiest way uh, to treat large areas. The last tool I want to talk about today is fumigation. Uh, with fumigation, I'm talking about the use of toxic gases within burrow systems. I already mentioned um, soil moisture is key for the efficacy of these products. So late winter through early spring um, is oftentimes a, a good time to manage gophers, in part because you have the highest soil moisture, but also because that um, 
if you hit that time frame, that's oftentimes right before one of their reproductive pulses. And so you can knock them down before you have a bunch of the, the new ones running uh, around. For ground squirrels, you want to wait until after they emerge in springtime uh, to begin your application. Um, I say springtime sometimes um, depends on, uh, on where you're at in the state. Oftentimes they'll emerge from hibernation um, in late winter. But you do want to wait until they emerge from hibernation. Um, if you apply during hibernation, the toxic gases don't get to them because they plug themselves up in a nesting chamber below ground. So you do need to wait until they're active above ground before you can utilize uh, these fumigants. And then I need to stress too that fumigation should not be used in or around buildings. We don't always know where these burrow systems are going. Sometimes these burrow systems go up and underneath these structures. And when they do, then those gases could potentially leak up and into those structures, causing um, pets, people, livestock to potentially get sick or even succumb uh, to those gases. So you gotta be very careful where you use them. Uh, read the labels, they will tell you how far away you need to be. Most of the labels these days um, require you to be 100 feet away from those kind of structures. So as far as fumigation options, we do have gas cartridges. These are essentially glorified smoke bombs. You light a fuse, you shove it down into the burrow system, which creates a lot of smoke, a lot of carbon monoxide, which will asphyx asphyxiate the animal. They work pretty well for ground squirrels, 70, 75% efficacy, so pretty good. Um, they're also not a restricted use product. So that's nice. So if you have just a few burrow systems to treat, um, they can be beneficial from that perspective. But they're also more expensive. And so if you have a lot of burrow systems to treat, there's probably gonna be some cheaper options for you. Now they are registered for use for pocket gophers as well, but they generally do not work well for gophers. So I don't really recommend their use for gophers, but they do work well for gas cartridges. And keep in mind, you're, you're lighting more or less a smoke bomb. So they have a tendency to flare up. Um, you could start fires if you're not careful. So be very careful when utilizing them. We also have aluminum phosphide. Um, common commercial products include phostoxin, fumatoxin, weevilcide, uh, these are tablets or pellets that you introduce into the burrow system, which then reacts with moisture in the burrow system to create phosphine, which is a gas that is highly toxic to all animals. This is a highly efficacious tool when it comes to both ground squirrel and gopher management. We see 90 to 100, 97 to 100% efficacy for ground squirrels, 90 to 100% efficacy for pocket gophers. Really, this is one of the best tools we have for managing these species, but it is also um, by far the most restrictive of these products out there. Um, you certainly have to be a certified applicator to utilize it. You have to be able, you have to follow your notice of intent, your pesticide use report. Um, there's a fumigation management plan that has to be completed. Uh, you have to post sites for 48 hours. So there's a lot of potential hoops to jump through to utilize this product. So it's probably not something you're gonna utilize um, for just a few burrow systems, but if you're somebody who has extensive problems with gophers or ground squirrels, um, this is a very effective tool and is something you might want to look into. And then more recently, we have the legalization of pressurized exhaust machines, which include the PERC machine, the CO jack, the Cheetah rotor controller, and the Burrow RX. Um, these are devices that inject exhaust into the burrow systems. Some of them, like the PERC machine and the CO jack, allow you to treat multiple burrow systems at once, whereas others, like the Burrow RX and the Cheetah rotor controller, uh, only allow you to treat one burrow system at a time, but but are um, cheaper. As far as efficacy, uh, we've tested them for both gophers and ground squirrels. Uh, we see, I'd say, moderate efficacy for gophers, 60 to 65 percent overall. Um, there are certainly better tools out there, but there are worse tools as well. And one of the really nice things about, um, in particular, what we tested was the perk machine. And with the perk machine, we can treat multiple burrow systems at once. And we found that you can treat fields far more rapidly with the perk machine than with a lot of the other tools. So you can save some time um, when utilizing um, this approach. So I think there's benefits for it from that perspective. We've looked at it for ground squirrels as well. Uh, in particular, for California ground squirrels, we had 100% efficacy in moist conditions. We actually tested it in dry conditions as well and had 66% efficacy, which is far greater than what I ever would expect any other burrow fumigant to, to accomplish in dry conditions. So there may even be some utility for this device in dry conditions, but certainly in moist ideal conditions, it's very efficacious. So again, to recap, I think they work great for ground squirrels, moderately well uh, for gophers. 
We did look at the cheetah rodent controller, which is different than all the other devices, and then it's more of a, a modified leaf blower type device. And we did not see very good results for ground squirrels in our study, as you can see here. Um, so it's not something that, you know, at least based on our results, that that seemed to work very well. The last thing I'm going to mention is that um, there now is a carbon dioxide injection device that has been legalized for use called the Eliminator. Um, you utilize a canister of CO2 to inject it into burrow systems. Um, not a lot of data on it yet. Um, the little data that I, I am aware of um, suggests that it should be relatively equivalent in efficacy to the pressurized exhaust machines. Um, so th that's my guess as, as, as far as how well it'll work, um, but it hasn't been tested super extensively yet. So the last thing I will, I will show here today are a couple of useful resources for you. The first one I mentioned already, that's the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website. This is really meant to be your one-stop shop when it comes to managing ground squirrels. Um, so if you have ground squirrel issues, certainly I would recommend that you check it out. You can see here at the bottom, uh, talks about calculating CO2 flow for euthanasia chambers, which is what I talked about. Shows you how to construct bait stations, um, how to calibrate your seed spreader, and tons of other great information. So if you're looking for more information on ground squirrel management, please check out that website. For gophers and bulls, I would direct you to the vertebrate pest control handbook, where I have revised chapters not too many years ago for pocket gophers and bulls. Uh, most of that information is, is up to date for those species. Um, there's lots of great information on this in this handbook for a, a variety of different vertebrate species. Some of them are outdated though. Um, the ones that say revised are those that, that should be pretty accurate. Uh, for the other species, a lot of the information will be good, but certainly some of the pesticide information may be out of date, so keep that in mind. And then truly this time, my, my last slide, for those of you who want more information um, on managing vertebrate pest species, I certainly would encourage you to check out the uh, Vertebrate Pest Conference, which is coming up March 7th through 10th in Reno, Nevada. Um, we have three days of concurrent sessions and one day of field trip uh, where we have um, experts really from throughout the world that, that come in and talk about all kinds of, of vertebrate related issues. And we also offer CE units for, for folks who attend. So uh, if you're looking for more information along those lines, I encourage you to uh, check that out. And with that, um, be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Roger, for your presentation. Um, Michelle's going to pop on and we do have questions in the Q&A for you. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, the first question is, any control of ground squirrels using bubble gum in feeders or in burrows? Okay. <clears throat> so the short answer is no. This is maybe the most common question I get. So I don't know who started this decades ago, um, but it started a long time ago because a predecessor of mine actually did a study just to, to see if it actually would work. They, they did it on, on gophers because it's usually gophers that people talk about and not ground squirrels with, with bubble gum. But the short answer is no, bubble gum has no impact whatsoever on these rodent species. And so I, I wouldn't, you know, be moving in that direction. Yeah, the, the next question is repellent for gophers, castor oil, is that effective? So castor, that, that's a good question. Um, castor oil has been shown in some settings to be an effective repellent for moles, but not so much for gophers. Now it has, hasn't been tested a ton for gophers. So that's not to say that in certain settings and in certain situations, maybe there could be some benefit to it. Um, but for the most part, I would say the answer is probably no for gophers. But moles, if you have problems with moles, maybe maybe there is some, some applicability there. I will caution, though, with moles, the study was done with eastern moles in Kentucky, which are different than our moles out here. So I'm not sure it completely translates, but at least it's it's some, some kind of information. Um, and then this question, any experience and feedback on the use of carbon monoxide generators for managing burrowing rodents discussed today, specifically gophers. Yeah, so that's what I just presented on there at the end here today. The, um, the pressurized exhaust machines do work moderately well for gophers. Um, like I said, you know, some other tools like aluminum phosphide and trapping are both more efficacious. 
Um, strychnine is potentially more efficacious, but I do see utility in the use of the pressurized exhaust machines for gophers as well. Um, I particularly see value if you're somebody who has both gophers and ground squirrels, um, because you can use them for both and they work really well for, for ground squirrels. Um, there's also, you know, people are just more accepting of their use in some settings than they are of traps or rodenticides. And so we're starting to see them used more, particularly in urban and residential areas, although they have to be careful about fumigating too close to, to structures. But um, we do see, do see more acceptance of their use in some of those settings as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's utility. Um, they're, they're not necessarily the most efficacious, but, but they're effective. And, and again, if you're utilizing one of those devices that allows you to treat multiple burrow systems at once, then you gain the benefit of being able to move through areas more rapidly. So, you know, maybe you have to come back and treat two or three times, but maybe from a cost effective perspective that that works out. Um, the next question, does protect T work with above ground drip systems? So the answer is twofold there. Number one, I don't know is the first answer. And the second answer is it's not registered for that use. So you're really not allowed to use it in that way anyways. Um, certainly, I think it's something that the company is interested in looking at. Um, my gut reaction is that it probably won't have a dramatic impact, but maybe it will. I, I don't know, um, partic particularly when it comes to, to actual chewing damage. Um, but even if it does reduce chewing, then how long does it reduce it? In other words, how long does the repellent actually work? And would you have to apply it every time you irrigate? Because that gets expensive, um, applying the, the product. Um, each time. So there's a lot to be worked out, but the, the, the shortest and, and best an answer right now is it's not registered for that use. So it's, it's not an option. Um, for gophers, how about using human hair placed in multiple locations throughout the tunnel network? Okay. Yeah. We sometimes hear people trying that with deer um, as a potential repellent. I haven't heard about that used for gophers too much. Um, I'd, I would not anticipate that being an overly effective strategy. I, I haven't seen it, you know, looked at, so I, I can't say, you know, specifically on that front. But keep in mind, you know, I did mention that we looked at human scent and the impact of human scent on trapping, and it had no impact at all. Um, so I, I don't anticipate that being effective. Um, this is a comment from someone. They said, I did not find the gophinator to be more effective. The smaller gophers can escape. You have to have specific sizes. Okay, so um, when we did our study, we looked at various different size classes of gophers, in, in, including the smaller size classes. And for these smaller size classes, and, and uh, I don't know if it's worth going back here. I'll go back to it anyways, because why not? Um, if you look at this chart here, the smallest size class, we had no, we saw no difference between the Maccabee and the Gophinator. Um, so if we're dealing with small gophers, they both work equally well. Um, the, the person who asked the question is correct that the Gophinator comes in a couple of different sizes. The smaller size is designed specifically for moles, but it does work very well for gophers too. And so oftentimes what I would do is carry a few of the smaller size ones in the bucket with me and then a bunch of the larger size ones. And when I would come across a juvenile tunnel, and you know it's a juvenile tunnel because the tunnel size is similar to the size of, of the gopher for the most part, um, you would utilize the smaller trap in that situation. So, you know, I, I can't speak for everybody and I can't speak for all situations, but certainly um, in our study, and we tested throughout the state across 12 different um, sites. Uh, so it, it was a very extensive study. Um, we, we certainly, although we didn't see any benefit to using the Gopinator for the small size class, we didn't see any detriment to it either. Um, what about the Rodinator? Ah, oh. uh, the Rodinator. <laughs> okay, so the Rodinator is a gas explosive device. Um, what it is is a device that it allows you to inject a mixture of propane and oxygen into the burrow system. 
and is then ignited and it blows up, theoretically killing the animal through a concussive force. Um, we have actually tested this in vineyards in Sonoma County and it did not work very well. Um, average of about 30% efficacy. As you can imagine, when you're blowing things up underground, there are potential hazards as well. Um, and they're really loud, um, several times louder than a shotgun blast. So um, your neighbors may not be happy with you. Your neighbor's dog may not be happy with you. Um, certainly, if you're going to utilize these devices, I would encourage you to contact the sheriff's department and let them know beforehand so that they don't come screaming out there wondering what's going on on your property. Um, but they are out there. They are used. I have heard reports of people who've had some success with them, um, but certainly the UC trials, both for ground squirrels and gophers, have not been overly successful. The, the next question is, has there been any studies conducted or do you have any knowledge on dehydrated potato or vit vitamin D bait for pocket gopher control? Okay, so the dehydrated potato, I, I haven't heard of that before. I don't know um, what the basic premise there is, it, except that potentially maybe it would balloon in the animal's stomach or something like that, which... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine that that would work. Now, the vitamin D one, though, is, is an interesting one. Um, so there is, so vitamin D3, um, colocalciferol, is a verdenicide. Um, it is registered for use against Norway rats, roof rats, and house mice in and around buildings and structures. It is not registered for use against pocket gophers. Um, so it's, it's not an option. But building on that a little bit, we have tested it. I have tested it for gopher control. It did not work well for gophers. But we have looked at combinations of anticoagulants and colocalciferol. Um, and they did work very well for gopher control. Basically, what happens is uh, the anticoagulant acts as a synergist to uh, uh, increase the potency of colocalciferol, so you can actually use lower concentrations of each active ingredient and increase the overall efficacy of it. Um, so we did have really positive results on that for, for gophers, um, but nobody has taken up the registration process on it because it's really expensive to register these kind of products and right now they don't see the need to do so. Um, I would like to see somebody do that, but, but they haven't yet because I think it could be another potential tool when it comes to, to managing gophers. Um, we have several other questions. Um, I know it's uh, two, six, or 12, 16. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna keep going. I hope that's appropriate. Far away. Um, is, is there a, a concern with pets eating uh, gophers or ground squirrels that have been poisoned? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, for zinc phosphide, the risk of uh, secondary exposure, which is where a non-target animal feeds on uh, an intoxicated rodent, um, with zinc phosphide, secondary exposure is extremely low to almost non-existent. So with zinc phosphide, you don't have that concern. With strychnine, you do have that concern. Now, grounds... Uh, you're only using it for gophers and gophers live, you know, 90% of their life or more than that is spent below ground. So the odds of, of a gopher dying above ground is pretty minimal. So if you're in an open area, that kind of exposure risk is very low. It's not non-existent, it's not zero, but it's very low. Now, if you're in your backyard where you have a dog that likes to dig around and potentially could smell a dead gopher and then dig it up, then you have that potential risk. And so I, you know, I, I would use a lot of caution in using strychnine in that kind of setting. But if we're talking about field applications, then strychnine uh, for gophers probably doesn't have much, much risk. Now, and that, that applies for all gopher rodenticides. Um, I think the, the secondary exposure risk uh, from, from, from gophers is quite low. For ground squirrels with the first generation anticoagulants, there is the potential for some secondary exposure. Now I did complete a study here a couple of years ago, looking at the fate of intoxicated ground squirrels. In other words, do they die above ground or do they die below ground in their burrow systems? Because if they die in their burrow systems, then they're not really exposed for, for secondary um, toxic, uh, toxicity related issues. And 80 to 90% of them do, do die below ground. 
So the vast majority of them are removed from that scavenger you know, um, food chain, if you will. But some of them do die below ground. Now, these first generation anticoagulants are, have much lower toxicity than second generation products, which have historically been used for rats and mice and not for field rodents. And I don't wanna get into that too much today. Um, but there is some risk. And so, you know, if a dog or a coyote or a fox ate two or three ground squirrels, um, that, that could be enough to get a lethal dose that way, which is why the labels generally require you to perform carcass searches um, during a bait application process when utilizing these products. That's where you're supposed to go up and down your vineyard, for example, on a daily basis and look for, for dead or dying ground squirrels and remove them. And so, you know, if you're in that kind of situation, you know, that's what you're supposed to do to, to um, eliminate that risk. Okay, I just wanted to jump in for a second. Um, for those that are need to take the quiz, I put the quiz link in the chat um, that you can click on and take the quiz for today for continuing education units. Um, Roger, if you're still available, we do have a few more questions if you'd like to continue. Yeah, let's just do it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, how effective is Agrid, in parentheses, I think a vitamin, on gophers? Was it Agrid, A-G-R-I-D? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so um, that's the colocalciferol product that I was talking about, the vitamin D3, and it is not registered for gophers, so, so it's not an option. Um, but when we did test it, it, it didn't work well. So... Um, that's kind of a no on both accounts. <laughs> Great. Um, do either gophers or moles share burrows or tunnels? They do not share them at the same time, but if one dies or one moves on somewhere else, then the other will move in and utilize those old burrow systems. And same thing for voles. So there's a lot of overlap um, Spatially, not temporally, but spatially, um, uh, between voles, gophers, and moles. The next question, do you put the gophinator inside of a piece of PVC before inserting it into the tunnel? Nope, nope, definitely not. Um, that would be a lot more work. Uh, really, all you need to do is, um, you know, the general process is, is we probe to find the tunnel system. Uh, once we find the tunnel system, we dig a hole. Uh, we clear out all the loose soil uh, from within that burrow system, you know, through the digging process. And then you slide the traps as far into those tunnel systems as you can get them and then stake them down. And then that works well. Um, the, the key here is, is getting them as far into the tunnel system as you can. The entire trap really needs to be in the tunnel system. Because if you leave part of that hanging out, particularly the trigger part, the gopher usually plugs it up before it gets to that trigger part and you won't catch them. But shoving it far down in there um, greatly increases the likelihood that um, you'll be able to, to catch that gopher. And one thing I'll mention, if you want more details on, on trapping gophers, if you go to my personal website, um, uh, just Google Roger Baldwin, UC Davis, it'll pop up. Um, I have a video on gopher trapping there. It's a five minute video um, that showcases the whole process of, of setting gopher traps. Final question, how about chocolate X-Lax for baiting gophers? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I mean, again, it's one of those things that's not registered, right? So it's, it's not a legal use regardless. Um, chocolate, uh, which contains theobromine and caffeine has been shown uh, to be toxic to dogs. Um, and they've looked at it as a potential predicide, although it never was registered. Uh, but for gophers, I haven't heard of anything along those lines and, and there's no reason that I would I can think of as to why it would work. Certainly it's not a legal application anyways. Okay, thank you so much, Roger, for your presentation.